your dad passed in 212? 2013. 2013. And uh, I'm sure he's missed by a lot of people and whatnot. How long had you been discussing the script? Uh, for Green Book? Well, I, you know, I, I interviewed him in like 1989, 90. Who's so that? Your dad? My father. And then uh, I tape recorded a cassette. You know. Then he said, okay, well, we got to talk to Dr. Cheryl. You got to get his side of the story and we got to get his approval, what he'll let in or won't let in. So I started having long phone conversations with both of them on the phone, you know. In those days, you had the extension, one phone in one room, another phone in another room. And I took tons of notes, and he told me uh, what was what. He told me about the trip, and he said, the only people on this trip are me and your father. So I never want you to talk to anyone else about me. Don't ever talk to my family. This is it. What I tell you, that's it. You got to promise me that. I don't want anything about the rest of my life in it. Because maybe he was thinking of doing his own book or his own movie. Because people say, oh, it's not enough about him. It's exactly what he wanted in. So all that criticism, oh, it's about your father. Well, yeah, of course it's about my father. He told me the story. So I'm telling you from my father's perspective how this guy from the Bronx went on this trip with this genius piano player. But I didn't have more Dr. Shirley in it because he didn't want it. He said, I, don't, I only want you to tell from when I met your father to when we were on the trip together. So that's what we told. And he also was a psychology uh, uh, major. He he he, had, he studied it, and he... So, like, he would tell me that he would say things just to push my father's buttons to see how he would react, because he said, I never met anyone like your father before. So some things he might have said or done, maybe he didn't really say or do uh, outside of that, but he told my father. So I just put in what he told my father and me. And then we, we have it. But their, their, their stories all got corroborated, and he approved everything that was going to eventually be in the script. Now, Dr. Shirley or your father, they died months apart. Yeah, just by coincidence. They so just, their family or Dr. Shirley didn't get to see this beautiful story, I mean. Right. They didn't, Each one of them didn't get. But Dr. Shirley, I didn't know about his family, and I got criticized for that, too. At the time, I didn't know about his family because in 1991, when he told me, don't ever talk to my family, I mean, I, I, he could have had 10 brothers, two brothers. The only brother he had mentioned was one, so he told my father, yeah, I got a brother somewhere. So I never, at that time, there was no looking anyone up on the internet, but even years later, when I was closer to making the movie, I didn't look up his family because he told me not to do that. I mean, you know that, you're from New York. If, you, if I say to you, I don't want you to do this, uh, but you can tell my story, but you give me my w word. Don't talk to my family. Don't make it until after I die. Done. What would you do? Done. 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 You give your word, you're a stand-up guy. Done. Right? So I gave the man my word. I waited till after he passed away. He didn't want it in there. Anything done till after that. And I also didn't reach out to anyone because that's what he asked me to do. Did the family come out after the movie was released? Or? Family came out afterwards uh there was a lot of press about it saying i didn't do my due diligence i didn't talk to them which again put me in an awkward position because he told me not to talk to them and what more due diligence could i do than talk to the man himself so i did as much due diligence as i could do but you got to remember this happened in 1962-63 i talked to him about it in 1990-91 I didn't start making the movie, uh, start even writing a script with Peter Farrelly and Brian Curry till 2015. This is, you know, 50 years. Uh, I, I didn't know. I didn't look up the family because the family couldn't have told me anything about the trip. And I told them I wouldn't look up the family. So they were upset and I felt bad about that. But then they, uh, you know, they, they said some some kind of hurtful things that I didn't think were necessary, but there's nothing I could do about it. That's what I said. I promised the guy I wouldn't talk to them. But they reached out to them. They invited them to screenings. They even pre-screenings before the movie came out in New York. They, they invited them. They said, would you like to see it? And even though you're hearing about some of the family that were mad, there was a lot of family members and friends that said, this is beautiful. It's exactly how he was. You guys captured it perfectly. I remember that trip. Some people remembered it. And um, so I think for the most part, most of them were happy. There were a few that weren't, but... You're not going to make everybody I, happy. No, of course. At the end of the day, no, nobody's going to be happy. Well, we tried to make... Know. Listen, Rehearsal's portrayal, beautiful, beautiful man, beautiful portrayal of the guy, a genius. I think we showed him in, in 
showing what what a, what a genius he was. Listen, no one would even know his name right now. No one would know who he is. No one would know about the Green Book. So it wasn't a biopic of Don Shirley. It was a little slice of life, a little portion of his life like my father. A little portion of his life. And everyone took great care. Peter Farley, everyone, the, from when we wrote it to producing it to Pete directing it and to Mahershala portraying him. I think uh, it was a beautiful job. The guy's known. People are downloading his music. I mean, he was sort of a lost, one of those lost guys that, that uh, in his time he was known. But he wasn't like a big, big name outside of uh, the jazz world and in that in that classical sort of world. So I'm glad his name is out there. People know who he is. They know his music. They know what the Green Book is. And though we made a pre- the movie's not that bad. It won Best Picture. So we didn't do that bad. I think it was a tremendous <laughs> movie. You know, in a world where I like certain fucking movies, Nick. I don't go see everything. I don't want to see the Avengers. I don't want to see a lot of shit. I don't want to see remakes. I'm done. I'm 56. I've seen it all. <laughs> I've seen the good ones and the bad ones. And once you're in a movie, you see behind the curtain why a movie's made. No capes. Way. You don't want to see the capes. No capes. Yeah. No capes. No <laughs> nothing. So to me, that movie, it, it came somewhere where I, you know, where I've been. You know, I was telling people here that sometimes I say the word Arab or whatever. When I was in college, my tutor was Muhammad Zabib. He would come to my house. I would go to his house. He would tell me about that culture. So whatever the fuck you say, it doesn't really matter because I know the truth. They're sweet people. So we've all gone through that transition where we prejudge somebody. Yes. You know? The way your family did it was hilarious in the movie because that's the way every family was. You know. Sure. Uh, fuck. The two glasses. I saw crazier shit. Yes. I saw crazier shit. You know. I, I to me, I, I in. It reminded me of like just like there's movies used to have like a point. Now now like a lot of movies out there are just like even I, I like action movies, but there's not. It's just it's a fun two hours where stuff blows up, and I like something where you learn something. You get tra- like I, like you learn about that time. You learn about like I'd heard about uh, something like the Green Book, but seeing them go to the bar when he gets drunk and the guys are beating him up, I'm like. Wow, that and then the the scene that I really liked was when they the car broke down and the the guys were working yeah. in the field. That was I was like, wow, that. Those are the scenes that they mean something. To you. Look at when you watch Rocky, you feel something, right? There's certain movies you watch, you don't feel dick. Well, that's what I wanted to do. I you felt know, something I, when I watched your movie. I, I wanted to make a movie that people felt something, and that you know, I made a lot of crap before that. But you try, you know, I was kind of in the minor leagues of movie making, making lots of independent movies, never having enough money, whatever the excuses are. But I always wanted to make those type of feel-good movies, you know, like Frank Capra movie or, you know, The Bicycle Thief or a Walt Disney movie. The movies that make you feel. There's room for everything else. I love action movies. I I like superhero movies if they're good. Whatever it is, if it's, if it's entertaining, I think there's room for everything. But... Uh, when I talked to Brian Curry about it to bring him on to write with me, and then we went to Pete, we all, you know, wanted to make a movie that touched people. We're not solving racism. It's just a slice of life, but uh, there's a little hope at the end of it. And it's, just, it's, a, it's a story about human beings. I never thought about black and white. I just thought it was about two people, and that's how you should look at it. So I think, uh, like I said, we were very meticulous about the script, and then when Pete's direction was impeccable, I mean, he should have been nominated for Best Director. I don't, that, that, to me, is a travesty. How does a movie get nominated for Best Movie? Would it direct itself? Do you know what I mean? I feel the same way about Bradley Cooper. He should have got nominated for Best Picture. The movie's a Best Picture. That should be a thing. If it's a Best Picture, the director should be nominated. Nothing against the other guys that got nominated. But how is Pete Farrelly not nominated when his movie wins Best Picture? Something wrong there. But my point is, Pete did a hell of a job. We, we all cared about it. And it's filled with, uh, I think there's a truthfulness to it, despite what some people think. All those little incidents really happened. The only uh, uh, creative license we took was it happened over a year and a half period. We moved them around. Pete wanted to concentrate it, so we did it in that two-month period Eight before weeks, Christmas. Right. But that's, you know, it's not. it all actually happened. We just took all the best stories and put them together. And we knew, okay, this is a this is a true story, and I think that's why it resonates. That's why you feel something, because 
it's not a bunch of garbage. So it's not a lie. You're feeling you, these, these things happen. These people really were affected. And, uh, you know, this criticism, oh, all of a sudden, Tony Lip's character <coughs> turns around in two months. Well, it wasn't two months. It was always a period of time. But, yes, he did turn around. He changed his life, how he raised us, how he treated other people. Uh, so um, I was happy to, I was able to get that story of the screen. And uh, The one I didn't understand, the one that, the one that fucked with me a little bit was, and it was funny and sad at the same time. Not even funny is when he straight out and he caught him at the Y. Or whatever the fuck it's supposed to be. Right. You and I both know at that time period, people like you and me would have been shocked. Like I, I would have been shocked. You know, your dad didn't really judge him at that period. No. You know, at that time, he just walked out of there. Did your dad tell you the story? The doctor tell you the they story? They both did. And the thing was, that's why even, you know, life is complicated and people are complicated. So, you know, the word racist, I guess, it, it, it means one thing to a lot of people. So you see something like the the glasses at the beginning. You go, oh, that's a racist mf you know. But again, I, and this is, a, I don't, I don't like give. There's no excuses, but one thing or how a person is doesn't mean he's completely one way or he has a bad heart or he has a. Uh, he was. He wasn't. He wasn't a racist in the sense he wasn't walking around with a hood in his head. He was a people person. He loved people, human beings, and he didn't really judge people. Like my whole life, we, we were around all kinds of people, and he loved other people's cultures and food and how they laughed, how they danced. It didn't like how how they dressed. He would love it if he saw something. It didn't matter if you were black, white, Jewish. So even though. In the culture, and you know, growing up in, in, in New York and stuff, there were tribal groups. But everyone stayed with their own kind. But my father, once he mixed with people, he, he treated them all the same, and he brought us up to do that. So in that particular sense, like he says in the movie, I've been around nightclubs all my life. I know it's a complicated world. He's he done and seen everything in the city, right? He's in nightclubs. He was working at the uh, Wagon Wheel and the Peppermint Lounge. He grew up knocking guys out. He was all over the place. He saw it all. So he said he knew when he met Don Shirley. He says, I knew he was gay when I met him. I didn't care. What do I care? It was his business. Nothing to do with me. He was a nice guy to me. Treated me fantastic. So I was there to protect him, and I protected him. And I'm not there to judge him what he wanted to do or what he didn't want to do, but I don't want him going out without me because I, I don't want him getting beaten up. I don't want him getting arrested. I was trying to, in those days, he says in the movie, you know what would happen if this got out, your career and everything? Because they were judged for that. So he had a good heart with people, even though he was this rough and tumble guy. And that's what that scene was about, and, that, and it really happened. So uh, we put it in. Has there been any thought to making a television show just so you could go a little bit more in depth into some of the stories? Uh, it's never really come up. It, it, you know, you, you got you got some cash. You want to fund it? I, 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 I'll be a very small investor. <laughs> it's just how many scripts did you write before this? Oh, I, I had a bunch of a lot of of independent movies. I mean, that were made. Uh, first movie was a movie called Deadfall <coughs> with Nick Cage, Michael Bean, uh, Talia Shire, Peter Fonda. It was a good cast. In all this writing, all through the years, did you ever think of winning an Academy Award? Did you ever think it was possible? Was it something on the back burner, or was it something like me? You never even think about it. You just live your life. It wasn't like you just have oh, to I eat. Gotta win. I'm going right. to win an Academy Award. I, like any other kid, or even just person, not even in the film industry. When you watched the Academy Awards growing up, you always think, "Oh, what would I say if I was up there? What what would it be like to be up there? Or maybe I'll be up there one day." But not actually when I was doing the work to do something, just trying to make the best movies you can, even if I'm making a crappy little movie. <coughs> and I made a lot of those. I'm still trying to make something good. I, I never thought of Academy Awards, and when we started getting on this ride, uh, it was a nice thought, but you know. To me, it sounds cliche. The reward was I got the movie made with a lot of big people. It got seen. The audience response was unbelievable. This awards-like sort of uh, uh, campaign, 
That was rough, man. That was rough. Really? So, that was, I, I said, these people, I mean, I used to play ball, baseball and stuff. And you win, you win, you lose, you lose, you shake hands at the end of the game. That's how I was brought up. This is a brutal, brutal people. If they could chop your head off, they would. And I uh, I got a little thrown off by that. And then I started, we, we, we were getting attacked on every level. Like I said, the Shirley family would press. Oh, he's lying about this. Him and his father are racists. Uh, you know, Vigo got attacked. Uh, Pete Farley got attacked. I got attacked brutally. Uh, people are trying to knock the movie down. But How bad does it feel when somebody calls you a liar? Crap. And you know that you're telling the truth. And you really don't give a fuck. You know, like, you like, if he thinks I'm lying, I really don't give a fuck what he thinks. I know what happened. I was right. there or whatever. But, like, you know, I had to keep my mouth shut with a lot of things because of the good of the movie and the right. publicity. Because the more you say, I noticed that a couple of things I tried to explain, even though I'm telling the truth, they twist it. They twist so it. even when I told the truth on a couple of things, they said, oh, yeah, he, that's convenient. Yeah. He didn't ensure he's saying that now. So how do you win? You can't win. You can't win. Uh, I don't even get into it. But there was a tweet I made in 2015 about, Whatever I made it about, and they took, they twisted it. It's not about what they said it was about, not what I meant to was what I was talking about at all, and I couldn't come out and uh, say, "Oh, that's not what I meant at all." You're reading it wrong. It's a tweet. So How beautiful not- is to take a look at one of your tweets? Well, 2014. First of, and sum you the fuck up in one fucking four, in one thing, in 140 words. Right. Well, first of all, it shows you that they were looking, digging. So that's the best that they could come up with, right? Uh, some stupid tweet I made. I'll, I'll say what it was. They were talking about, uh, uh, it was about when, um, I guess, Trump was saying he saw Muslims cheering uh, uh, in, in uh, 9-11 on rooftops. He said he saw it on the news. So then the news came out and said, well, not he's nuts and he's lying because it was never reported, specifically CBS News. He said, I think I saw it on CBS or something like that. I used to work for CBS News. Two, uh, 9-11 was crazy in New York. As we were in the tri-state area, everyone was devastated. And uh, on CBS News, they reported that this was going on. Now, whatever. I saw it. I watched it. 2014-15, they said, oh, it was never reported. So for some stupid reason, that got I, I was pissed at the news. I'm like, how could they lie about that? Whether it happened or not, I don't know. I didn't see it happen. I saw the news report that said it happened. The news report said it happened. So all I said was, but I wrote it in an odd way. I said, yeah, 100% correct. Uh, uh, cheering going on. I think I saw it in CBS News. They came out and said I'm racist and I'm anti-Islamophobic. Uh, rants and tweets. Well, first of all, it was one tweet. No one, how, how does it make me racist? I didn't say, I, I just said I saw something on television. I saw the news report on television. That's it. But because it was a tweet, I could only write so many words. If I know I was right, if I don't write a dissertation, I would have said, oh, yes, I also saw the news report that said that on TV. It was on Channel 2. Crazy. What went on with that? is just insane, which shows they could say and do anything. So I didn't say anything about it because uh, for the good of the movie, they didn't want me to say nothing. I wanted to defend myself and say, well, what they're saying is not the truth. I'm being accused of something I didn't do or didn't mean. It wasn't even in my heart, mind, or soul what they're saying. And and that's what happened. So it taught me a great lesson. Uh, luckily, I was not a real tweeter. I think I only did 20 tweets so in my whole life about come see this movie, go see my movie. That <coughs> one in particular pissed me off because I thought, how could a news organization lie and say it wasn't on the air? Another one on YouTube, I found it. I found I found the uh, the news report. It's on, It was on. People, everyone else that knows me saw it, people in Jersey. And I got a lot of people don't know me said, oh, I saw that. But so what? I saw it on TV. What is that? What is that? We all saw planes hit a building. We saw the World Series being won. What if I said, "Yeah, I won the. I saw. I saw the uh, the uh, the Red Sox win the World Series." I saw it on television. I didn't do it. You know what I mean? It's bizarre. 
So they come after you even when you win the fucking right. thing. They so so, so it was it was it was a tough time. It, it kind of took the uh, the fun out of it for me. And um, but it didn't didn't stop the movie. And uh, the movie did well because I think people saw most people saw through that. I think it's a, a small minority, and then the people that report that stuff aren't real journalists. The real journalists, I met a lot of good ones along this trip, and uh, they're 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 good people and they have brains in their head and they 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 ask both sides of the story. This was just attack, 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 and uh, you know what? But I'm a big boy. I could take it. I dealt with it. I said whatever. I don't care what they think. So. Nick, a fucking Academy Award. I won two Academy Awards. You know what I'm saying? Academy Award. This is yeah. no. When you were writing it, who were you thinking of for the lead when you were writing it? Uh, I knew it had to be an Italian. Before I met with Pete and Brian a couple of years before, when I was first thinking about it, um, I talked to James Gandolfini about it, and he loved it. And I was thinking, I was well, not thinking, we were going to pursue that. Unfortunately, he passed away. So after he passed away, again, I put him sort of on the side burner. It's like you know, my father had passed away the same. Gandolfini, the last time I saw him was at my father's funeral. Four or five months later, he'd passed away too. So it was really a rough sort of time for me. And then when I started doing it again with Brian Curry and Peter Farrelly, lots of names came up. And we uh, we talked to a lot of different people. And Pete met with some people. And then it was Pete that came came to me and said, what about Viggo Mortensen? And I, Viggo Mortensen's one of my favorite actors of all time. And I went, wow, the Viggo Mortensen's unbelievable. I said, but Pete, I, I, there's something about it. I think the guy's got to be Italian or at least half Italian or have some of that sensibility because, you know, you start doing a bad New York Italian. Terrible. It's like a Saturday yeah. Night Live skit, right, you know? Right. Some guy's imitating Joe Pesci badly, you know? So, uh I thought about it, and I said, well, you know what? Who's the most iconic Italian character ever put on film? It's The Godfather. If you think of who's the biggest, The Godfather, Marlon Brando. Not Italian. Marlon Brando's Irish. Maybe mixed whatever he is, but no Italian. I said, you know what? Vigo is the guy with Marlon Brando. And I said, Pete, I think you're on to something. I think he can do it. I pictured it in my head. And Vigo, man, what a, what a job he did. That's my father. You watch that movie, that's exactly my father, how he was when, at that age. Vigo studied film, tape. Luckily, there was my father later in life was an actor, so he watched The Pope, he watched The Sopranos, he watched everything my father was in, listened to the tapes that I recorded of my father telling the story, and he just uh, gained 45 pounds, hung out with me and my brother and my uncles. He picked up not only the Bronx accent, but when he spoke in Italian, my father and his family had a, a, a uh, they were from Calabria. So the Calabrian accent mixed with the Bronx had its own sort of dialect, you know. And Vigo was right on it. But that was Pete's idea, and it, it turned out brilliant.